start that engine performance one test eight engine performance one test eight this is not a long test um, we don't uh, we don't really like long tests do we long tests are not good I've even shortened some of my final exams so that they're not quite so long okay uh, which of the following because you, you might remember you might notice that engine performance stuff is runs hand in hand a lot of it with engine repair you know, which of the following could result in low engine compression? A, damaged piston or piston ring. This is elementary stuff, guys, for engine people. B, damaged valve. C, cylinder head gasket. Any of them. How's a cylinder head gasket going to make me have low compression, Sean? What? How's a cylinder head gasket going to make me have low compression? Well, it's not going to be uh, some of your... Compressive force is going to be wasted or not utilized because it's going to force air out through the uh, wherever it's blown at. What if it's blown between two cylinders? What happened then? You end up with detonation. And no, what if it's blown between two cylinders? I mean, like yeah. yeah, like right between. Well, I think there's a picture over there of when it's blown between two cylinders. You get fluid in the. Uh, no, I mean, talking about just the little the little place between two cylinders. You're going to have low compression on two cylinders. Yeah. Because it's going to go back and forth. Could some of the fire go from oh, one oh, to the oh, other oh, bug, too, and uh, huh? cause detonation in the other cylinder? Not really. I mean, because the compression, well, typically, it depends on the breach, on how much of a breach it is, you see. Breach or whatever. Yeah. But it's basically, that fire ring has got to make, has got to handle all of that combustion pressure and temperature, and it's, you know, it's really something that it lasts as well as it does on most of these things. Now the newer ones have got multi-layer steel gaskets with you know rubberized them on it, and it's just different. But the older ones, like you see, this cut that ring around there, has got to handle all that. And um, it's and when you're I remember whenever you're putting a, and I, I harp on this all the time. But anytime you're putting a cylinder head or anything else back on, uh, make sure there's not any fluid in the bottom of that bolt hole, because if that bolt screws down against that, uh, it will stop when it hits that fluid. And Eddie's guys busted a big old diesel engine down there, putting it back together, one of his trainer engines. Because whenever the bolt hits some water that was in the bottom of the hole or oil or whatever it was, uh, they figured that they just needed to keep pulling on it with a cheater pipe to get that bolt to go on down. And that hydraulic pressure under that bolt cracked the block. I can hot that up fluid that was underneath it was. Always blow out those holes, you know, and make sure that there's not anything in there. And I actually, years ago when I was a teenager, I rebuilt a 440 Chrysler engine, and I did something similar to that. I mean, there was something in the hole, and it stopped before it got torqued down on the gasket, and it blew the gasket because I had to go back and pull the head off the next day. It was my car. I mean, you know, I was working at that gas station over and uh, And that was an interesting thing. This lady that, had, that owned that car, it was a black 67 Chrysler New Yorker, and it had a 440 in it. And in those days, you could afford to drive something with a motor that big. It would get eight, ten miles a gallon, you know. But anyway, um, this thing, she stopped at a gas station somewhere. It wasn't where I worked, obviously, you know. I mean, I tell you if it was, but it wasn't. It was somewhere in Enterprise. And she told this boy that was pumping gas to put some oil treatment in her engine. And so he put some uh, gas treatment in it, STP gas treatment. He just, because he got confused, and he poured the wrong thing in it. He didn't. You know, no way he was making a mistake. But what happened was, after that, uh, the very next day, uh, she went and started, and it had thinned the oil and cleaned all the oil off of the wrist pins. And uh, the pistons were so stiff on the wrist pins, the car wouldn't start. It go, rrr, rrr. Don't you love that window sound, whatever it boots up? But anyway, uh, so what we had to do, she, my daddy uh, traded her out of the car because uh, he had another car similar to that one that she wanted, and so he was going to sell that car, and then he found out he could get her car. My dad's a horse trader big time, you know. So he trades this car. He traded a, a fender off of a car I had one time for a sewing machine. We don't ever see him. Sounded like you, didn't he? But anyhow, uh, we'd pull that motor apart and pull the pistons out of it and took it up to the machine shop, and they pressed the wrist pins out and pressed them back in, lubricated it again, and put it all back together. I mean, that's the only time I've ever heard of anything like that happening. I'm sure it's happened before, but... STP gas treatment when you pour it in a crankcase makes a mess, so don't go there. Right? 
Yeah. You're supposed to be able to pour sea foam in the oil to treat it. You can. Sea foam won't hurt it. It and sea foam like. I don't know. It's flammable and it's a lot thinner and wouldn't it? Well, no. It actually, it basically, it doesn't do it. It cleans. The, there's we've done it too many times. I mean, sea foam ain't gonna hurt it. As a matter of fact, if you get a can of that sea foam uh, that you do for the engines, you put a third of it in a crankcase, a third of it in a gas tank, and you missed a third of it through the intake. That's what it's supposed to do. I mean, that's, that sea foam says to do it that way. So, and it ain't hurting nothing. Okay, when uh, preparing for a compression test, technician A uh, disables the ignition system. Uh, technician B only removes the spark plug for the cylinder he's testing. Uh, who's right about that? Either. Well, yeah, let's see. A is right. Uh, you're supposed to kill your spark. And I'll tell you something else you need to kill that they didn't talk about. You need to fix it so you're not going to have any fuel going in there. You know, kill your fuel system, kill your ignition system. Uh, if you disconnect the crank sensor, if it's got one that's easy to get to, you're going to kill your fuel injection. And you're also going to kill your spark. So that's a good way to go there. But if you just unplug the coil to kill the ignition system, you're still going to be spraying gas in there. And that, you know, that's going to foul up your readings because that gasoline, whenever it's not combusting and it's got enough lubricant in it that keeps the fuel pump greased, you know, like you can take gasoline nowadays and get it on your hand and wave it around and it still feels greasy. Have you noticed that? The reason for that is they lubricate in the fuel pump. When they first put electric fuel pumps in the mid '80s, and lots and lots of cars that had the fuel and high pressure fuel injection on them, it was wiping out those fuel pumps because there wasn't enough lubrication in the gasoline to do that. I guess if they poured some sea foam in there, take care of that one. Okay, yeah. but uh, but anyway, that's going to be a. You're going to uh, disable the ignition system, but you pull all the spark plugs out. This is something else you do when you're doing a compression test. Hey, I need to have you do a compression test today. Can you handle that? I mean, would you mind doing another one that's really hard to get the spark plugs out of because they're in a really bad place? Uh, we used to do it on these Ford Windstars, you know, where you'd have to reach way yeah. around the back of the engine. Don't you love that? But well, they, you need to, you know, you've, you've done them before, haven't you? Really, I might have shown them yeah. how to do it on the trainer engine of a Toyota. Yeah, it works. It ain't hard to do on that one, but it gives you a little something. Uh, anyway, um, you take all the plugs out, you hold the throttle wide open. Now, a lot of mechanics won't do that. They just spin it over, stand it outside the car. But you're really supposed to prop the throttle wide open. Now, what else happens when you prop the throttle wide open? If you kill the ignition system and you prop the throttle to, to wide open throttle, it kills the fuel injector, right? I mean, it's clear flood mode, so you're not going to have any fuel injector pulse whenever your you know, throttle's all the way on the floor. So that's one way you can do that. Uh, how many compression strokes should be used during a compression test? In other words, how many times should it puff? Actually, number two is A. Number three... Uh, should have four puffs. I like six, personally. At least four, but six is better. Now, something else that happens, have you ever done this? Have you ever tried to do a compression test, the ones of you that have done them, and had a uh, the needle bounce instead of going up there and stopping where it's supposed to go? You know, like, in other words, your compression gauge has got a Schrader valve in the bottom of it so that it pushes the air in, and it's supposed to trap it. You know what I'm saying? All right, so... Boom, 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 boom. It's supposed to go up there like that. But what will happen is occasionally you'll get sometimes uh, a little, if you do a wet test, you'll get a little oil in that Schrader valve and sometimes it won't seal good. <laughs> and then your gauge is bouncing, you know. Then you have to replace that Schrader valve on the bottom of your gauge. But four is the right answer on this one here, but I like to go more than four. But I guess four is basically going to give you a decent number. Uh, when performing a cylinder leakage test, which is correct, uh, a bubbles in the coolant may indicate all of them are correct except one. A bubbles in the coolant may indicate a defective head gasket. Is that true? You just said something similar to that earlier, didn't you? If it, if you're you know what a compression, whenever you're doing a, you got this thing with these two gauges on it, this little manifold, and you're actually putting air into the combustion chamber, right? With your air hose hooked up here, and you got a, you know, you're feeding air into that uh, spark plug hole. You're supposed to have both your valves closed. That one needs to be on top, dead center. Okay, so um, you shoot your pressure in there, and then one of these gauges is going to give you how much leakage you have. You're comparing how much air you're putting in to how much is leaking. 
so the differential potential to it. It's a special tool. I got one in there for doing it. And cylinder leakage shouldn't be any more than like uh, 20% or something like that. I mean, it, different manufacturers and different people like to tell you different things. But if you've got, let's say that you've got 40% cylinder leakage, the next thing you're willing to know is where is that air going? Right? You got me? You understand what I'm saying? Where's the air going? So what are you going to listen to? Where, what are the places, where could that place be going? It could be going four different places. If you've got a faulty engine, it could be going four different places. One place, if you've got both valves closed and you've got your piston at TDC with both valves closed on the compression stroke and you're putting air in there and you're losing 40% of that pressure, then you're going to be listening for it. You know, get your stethoscope, screw the end off of it so you can use it for a listening pipe. Take the oil cap off and listen to the crankcase. If a lot of it's going into the crankcase, shh, that's a rings or you got a piston with a little hole in it or something. All right? Then you're going to go to the intake manifold. If you hear it hissing in there, you got a burnt intake valve or when it's stuck open for whatever reason. If you go to the exhaust and you stick it up in your tailpipe and you hear it hissing in there, and you know you got exhaust, I mean, it's going into the exhaust system. Do you get where I'm going? You're actually trying to find out as much, and as much as you can. And a lot of our diagnosis is about doing the least intrusive test that we can to find out what's wrong. That makes sense? We don't want to have to tear this thing all the way down. And I don't know it, the people that didn't investigate the way that they should have whenever they were looking at a problem. And they say, well, I think I'll just jerk this out of there, jerk it out of there, go down here, tear this down. And they tear the thing all the way down, they put all these parts in there, they put it all back together, and they still got a problem because they didn't troubleshoot to begin with to find out what it was. What's worse is you find something that's burned out or burned up, and you fix what's burned out or burned up without finding out what burned it out or burned it up. And then some ways down the road, it burns out and burns up again. And so the work you did was pretty much wasted. See, so the whole thing, this is all about finding out what to do. Whenever somebody is bragging on how good their nephew or whoever is, a mechanic, they, what, what words do they say? They say, you can take it apart and put it back together from one end to the other. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a good mechanic. It just means he can take it apart and put it back together. And I'll, if I'm somebody, if I'm a consumer and I've got a problem with my car, I want the mechanic to say, I know what that is, and go snap, snap, click, tighten a couple of bolts. Even if he charges me an hour and a half labor, I know that he knew what he was doing because he instantly knew what to do to fix it. you got to know which wire to jump, which bolts to, you know, to do your diagnosis, which bolt to tighten, you know, what to do. Okay, so the least intrusive stuff is what we're after. All right, so the second one, if you're performing a cylinder leakage test, is this statement correct? Shop air should be applied through the spark plug hole. Is that correct? What did I just say? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Air heard escaping through the tailpipe may indicate a defective exhaust valve. Yeah. Okay. Shop air should be applied to the dipstick tube when you're doing a cylinder leakage test, right? Wrong. That's wrong. That's dead wrong. Now, shop air should be applied to the dipstick tube if you're looking for a, a leak in the splash oil area. Oil pan, valve cover, something like that. You know, stop it up. Put about 10 pounds of air pressure, maybe 15, on the crankcase through the dipstick tube and spray your soap bubbles around. You may find oil leak out It works. You know, we did that at the Ford place for years. I mean, when I was over there, we'd take a piece of hose and put it on the dipstick tube, stop up the, the PCV in the crankcase so that it, 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 had, it was trapping the air, and you, you'd use a regulated air supply. You know, plug it on, plug a regulator on your hose, and you got a little gauge there, and you dial it up to where you... You know that regulator that's on our oil... Evacuator, something like that. You're going to dial it up to about 15 psi, and just put that little bit of pressure on the crankcase. And if when it, if it's got a, a splash oil leak, not a pressure leak, then you'll find that that way. Now, you know, some people will take a screw the oil pressure sending unit out. If you've got a pressure leak, a leak that's in the oil, it only leaks when the engine, you know, it squirts out when the engine's running, and they're trying to find out where it is. They might put shop air. Take the screw the oil pressure sending the unit out and adapt an air fitting in there and put, you know, maybe 90 pounds of shop air pressure in the oil gallery, and you'll find that leak too. <laughs> you 
You also, if you want to know where, if you've got worn out bearings, it's causing your pressure to be low when the engine oil gets hot and thin. You pull that engine oil pan, drop the oil pump off, or sometimes the oil pump's in on a crank, nose of a crank, but whatever. If you pressure up the oil gallery, wherever you do it, if you do it through the oil sending unit or whatever, and you can actually have the pan off where you can look up in there and listen, you'd be surprised you can find all, you know, worn out parts that way. We've done that before here. Found cam bearings that were bad on a Jeep was causing to have bad oil pressure. And uh, so that, that's just the, some of the diagnostic uh, stuff that you do. So you can definitively put your finger on there and say, this is what it is, you know. Okay, uh, so number four is going to be D. That's not correct. Number five, to perform a cylinder leakage test, technician A says a 20% leakage is acceptable. Technician B says cylinder will show too much leakage if the piston is not at TDC on its compression stroke. And number five is basically both of the guys are right. 20% is typically, uh, seems to me like I've seen some book somewhere it said 30% was, it should be more than 30, but I don't like it to be more than about 10 myself. If I feel like it's got 20%, I don't like that, but 20% is what, you know, this, this uh, Haldeman here said. Okay, uh, cylinder power balance test is performed. Cylinders 1, 2, and 3 will drop 175 RPM when disabled with a scan tool. Cylinder 4 drops 50 RPM when disabled. The following statements are correct except... A, cylinder 4 is much weaker than 1, 2, and 3. B, there may be a mechanical problem with cylinder number 4. C, this test could also be conducted by grounding the plug wire for each cylinder. And D, number 4 is stronger than 1, 2, and 3. All right, that's number 6. D is the one that's not correct, right? This is one of those accept questions. Now, why, why did he talk about grounding the plug wire instead of pulling it off? You know what I mean? Grounding it. Let me see that test line over there. All right. When you've got a when you got a spark plug wire, you got a you got a boot here. I used to know a guy that whenever he would um, test the spark plug, I don't know what in the world he was thinking about. This guy right here was a had been mechanic for years. He'd take a test light and ground it, and he would pierce that boot. Well, that would kill the cylinder, but it also created a spark leakage thing, so if anybody happened to reach over when the engine running, to reach out and grab them, it'd fire you up. And I would, you, if you came across one that he had done that to, you know, all right, so you ground this, out there, and you go in here. Hey, Mister, can you tell me what this is? I don't mean to break in on the plants. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me what that is? That's a piece of a vacuum. Uh, you know, in other words, you had a, a, a T or something there, and it, went, it broke off. It was, it was up in this fuel line. About the down 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 yeah. yeah, somebody chugged it up in there with some. Really? Yeah. But that's what it is. And it basically, uh, it's a possibility. That looks like an orifice. Yeah, it looks like an orifice. Yeah, it's made up. It's made to actually slow it down for some reason. Now, I don't know how. Well, it was that on a fuel return here? Possibly. But see, it's got a little hole in it. So the hole is small. Yeah. See yeah. that? It was made to restrict that flow. That's what it was there for. We need to stick it back up in the fuel line. What is it on? 20 out of 91. Well, I will tell you that. Keep it, leave it out. If you develop any kind of a screwball problem, you'll, right back you'll, you'll know that you need to get it. There's a reason for that. <laughs> All right, so anyway, you're going to take your, uh, you're gonna take your uh, spark plug, I mean your test lap with a real sharp probe, and you're going to shove it between the boot and the wire right up in here. Yeah. See that? And you're going to get it to the point to where it's close enough to that, where it, you're not hurting anything this way. This is super sharp. But how make sure this is hooked to ground? Because if it's not hooked to ground, there's a little breach in this wire, you're going, like, it's going to fire you. <laughs> you don't want to go there. But anyway, if this is grounded, you're not going to get shocked. There's no way you can get shocked. It's not going to light the light either. This is just going to be like, a, like an electrical, I mean, like a short to ground. If you do every wire like that, you can find out which one's misfiring real easy. 
You, this one, it, it goes bub, 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 bub. You stick it, bub, bub, bub. It goes, boo. It doesn't change. I mean, it's still skipping, but it doesn't change anything. If it gets worse when you're killing that plug, or you can unplug injectors. It was easy to do. Some, the injectors have them be buried under a manifold and roll over or something like that. But uh, it, this is one way to do it. But anyway, if you pull them off, this spark is liable, is liable to hunt for somewhere else to go and damage something. You know, not that it's just worried, not too worried about getting shocked, but that uh, that voltage is, can be 120,000 volts. And if you're giving it, if you're taking away the path that it has to follow, it's going to find one somewhere else. And sometimes you'll destroy your ignition module or some other part by pulling those wires off. You know, but for eons, you know, mechanics that pull the spark plug wires off because usually the GM cars are really susceptible from what I've been able to gather to ignition module damage. If you got a spark plug right it's burned in two or something like that. So uh, anyway, uh, I got off on there, and uh, but uh, let me see. Technician A says removing the spark plug wire from a, oh, incidentally, I was on six, right? Or was I? Six is D. We already been there. Technician A says removing the plug wire from a spark plug while the engine's running could damage ignition system components. I just told you about that. Technician B says grounding a plug wire while the engine is running could damage ignition system components. That's number seven. A only. You're not going to hurt it if you ground it. Because what do you do then? The voltage goes really low. If you got a scope with a firing line there, it's going to be really high when you pull it off. It'll go just to nothing when you stick it on. So you ain't hurting a doggone thing by grounding it. As a matter of fact, the sun, I, I used an old sun scope years and years ago, and they had this insulated thing that had a point on the end of it it was just nothing more than a dead short in the ground and you would hook it up and you'd actually kill the wires one at a time that's how that would work alright so let me see here uh, technician A says well number 7 I already told you that that's a, uh, which is not a step in the cranking vacuum test A. crank the engine while observing the vacuum gauge that sounds like something you need to be doing in a cranking vacuum test, don't it? How much cranking vacuum should you have? Anybody know? 15 to 20. No, to cranking. Oh, that's oh, not, okay. We're not engine running. Cranking is only going to be like 15. Now here's the other thing. If you do a compression test, what are you expecting to see for compression? For compression? Yeah. Um, Varies a little from engine to engine, but what? Yeah. Well, you, don't re you generally run up. You've done it before. Come on, man. Well, what have you I'm seen? Trying, I'm trying to, to think of one that was had the least variation in it, but uh, typically, if you got a healthy engine for the most part, it's going to be about 160, 170 pounds. That's that's normal, pretty normal. If you have about 160, 170 pounds, um, and the lowest shouldn't be. I mean, you shouldn't have any that are a whole lot lower. The highest one and the lowest one should be compared, and they should be fairly close to one another. If you got one that's way out of, you know, you can use that oscilloscope I got out there with a current ramping probe to do compression test. That's a cranking compression test because you're going to look at the amp draw on the starter, and if you've got a, one that ain't got no compression, one of them's not going to pull as much amps <laughs> whenever it's squeezing air on that cylinder. And it's just like you can listen to your ear and you can tell if you got low compression on one cylinder because it'll go, wah, 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 you know, instead of going, bum, 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 a real steady puff. And you can hear somebody from all the way across the parking lot starting a car. And you come out of video warehouse, and they're over starting their whatever they're driving. And if you if it's one that's got, if particularly if it's a V8 and it's got a lot of cylinders, and you hear one of them pick up speed when it hits that way, and then it finally starts up, you can in your mind say, they got low compression on one cylinder. I got a little compression in my chainsaw, and uh, uh, you can listen to it and tell it does. I ain't got no power hardly, but you can just listen to it and hear it. Yeah. Well, you need a new chainsaw, mister. I get piston rings and a piston board. Yeah, that's something like that. But anyway, uh, now, what do you do? Connect the vacuum gauge to a source of manifold vacuum. That's right, isn't it? And how do we make vacuum? How does a, how does a, a gas burner make vacuum? When the uh, pistons move, it compresses... Compresses. The, compresses the cylinders and it it, it it sucks against the crankcase when it does so. Mm -hmm. So they're direct. So the vacuum and the uh, cylinder compression is pretty much directly proportional to one another in That's most cases. 
you're rambling, but that's okay. I understand where you're going. You're not doing bad. But let's just say that right here we have a throttle plate and we all, we've got pistons that are going down in their bores that are tied into that manifold. And as that piston goes down in its bore, it's creating, it's starting with what used to be a small place and making it a big place. How do you get a how do you get uh, the drink to come out of the cup into your mouth when you're drinking with a straw? You start with a, a small place in your mouth, you seal around the straw with your lips, and you make it bigger. Now, what does that do? The atmosphere pushes on the fluid and it comes into your mouth because you made low pressure in your mouth. Right? You did. You started out with a small place in your mouth, you make the place in your mouth bigger. You don't think about that. You learned how to suck when you were born. But basically, whenever you just, that's how you're going to do it. You don't think about it. You're making it, you start with a small place, make it a bigger place, and the atmosphere pressure, well, the atmosphere tries to go in here. You can do that now. You can make your lungs do that. They start with a small place, you expand them, the atmospheric pressure pushes the air in there. So that's how the same way the engine breathes. It starts with a small place with a piston up at the top, intake valve open, pulls it down, and what's it pulling against? Atmosphere is trying to get in here. It can't get in there because it's throttle is a little bit can go in there through your idle air control, which is a little passage like that that goes around and it's it's actually controlled, you know, by the uh, computer. It can open and close that, you know, with a different different ways it does it. But anyway, the long and the short of it is you're trying to pull and this pressure goes really low here, and this pressure out here is atmosphere. So if you've got a throttle plate, you're gonna have vacuum. Diesels don't have vacuum because they ain't got no throttle plate. You got it? You got no throttle plate on a diesel. There's air going through there, but you got no vacuum. How's air going there? Because the pistons are doing the same thing. Now, how do you control the speed and the power of a diesel? You put more fuel in there. You just change the amount of fuel you're putting in there. You squirt more fuel in there, it's going to run faster, it's going to have more power. When you operate your foot pedal, if it's an electronic diesel, electronically you're putting more fuel in it. Now, some diesels... I will, go, I will go so far as to say, occasionally you'll find a diesel with a throttle plate, but it's open just about all the time, wide open. And the only time it ever closes is when you're trying to create a differential in pressure so EGR will work. That's usually how that works. Why, hey, Vols, huh? why does the diesels just have so much more power than gas engines? Because the, whenever the, a gas engine fires, okay, and that's fairly easy to explain, um, you go, on a V8 engine... You got a firing event that happens every 15 minutes, every 90 degrees, right? Firing event, bam, 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 bam. All right. See, so you're you're going to be turning on each cylinder. I mean, believe it or not, uh, all of this amount of time, uh, you got this is about 24 degrees is about right there. Okay, on a uh, gas burner. The fire is all gone out by the time the piston has moved, by the time the crankshaft has turned that far past the firing event. And you're coasting until the next firing event. So basically the piston, you're slapping it. Bat, 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 bat. You know, you basically imagine yourself with a crank that's turning, you're slapping that crank. You can make it turn if you slap it hard enough. You know, but it's having to coast until the next time it gets slapped. Is that making any sense? Okay, but 24 degrees after, and how do we know this? Your crank sensors, most of them, the one, well, when Ford started coming out with theirs and Chevy, even Chevy does this too, uh, that cam sensor signal sends its signal 24 degrees after top dead center because that's when the fire has gone out. The fire has gone out by the time that crankshaft has turned 24 degrees past the firing event. Most people don't ever even think about that. Well, why do you do that? Well, you don't want your next injector squirt coming while there's still a fire burning in there, do you? You want to make sure that fires out before you can squirt again. So there's a window in which the injector can spray without worrying about causing some sort of a damage and explosion, right? All right. So right here, you've got this uh, this little little bit of window here on a diesel. Instead of slapping it, that fuel is burning all the way down. Now grab the crank you were slapping earlier and pump that sucker. <laughs> That's what a diesel's doing. It's pumping it. So all the way down, that, that engine, that diesel, that, you know, when it fires right here, like on a V8 diesel, that fuel is going to be burning all the way through this stroke. And you're going to have another one that's already busted off while this one's still pushing. So everybody's punching together. 
instead of going pow. Okay, wait a little bit. Now it's your turn. Pow. Well, that's what a gas burner is doing. The diesel engine, you know, you got multiple pistons pushing at the same time on a diesel. That's why it's got such legendary torque. Okay? That's why it gets better uh, thermal efficiency or, or somewhat. Than yeah, and i tell you something else. That diesel takes a long time to heat up. Yeah. It, it's, it's incredible how that is. Because you got to have it added an extra. you got a way to make it, the diesel get warm quick enough where you have decent cabin heat. Because, you know, they got a bigger cooler, so the cooling system on too. Okay, so if you've got... This is your V8 engine right here. I mean, I actually did that. Every, firing event every 90 degrees. Okay. On a V6, how far apart are they? This is degrees of crankshaft rotation, by the way. How far apart are they on a V6? 120. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You got that? Okay. Now, what about on a four-cylinder? Four-cylinder, 180. 180. So you got a firing event here. You got a whole half turn, or I like a whole half turn. That's sort of an oxymoron. You got a half turn before you get another firing event on that. Okay, this one here, you got a firing event every 120 degrees. Now, granted, you got six, you got eight cylinders here, you got six cylinders here, but you got 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. And the way you get that is you divide your number of cylinders into 720. And notice here comes a 90, that's 120, and that's 180. But you know, on these little rotary engines and these Mazda RX-8s, you know how many firing events you, how far apart, how close together those firing events are? Each rotor has three for each revolution. <laughs> is that crazy? Now, the crankshaft is actually turning three times as fast as a rotor. So it's getting more of a constant push, kind of like the diesel does? Yeah, sort of, or like a two-cycle engine. There's no valves in a rotary engine either. You know, it's you just open up. Can you make a diesel uh, rotary? I'm afraid to say. I mean, somebody can make it work. If you've got a cutting torch and a hammer, you can make anything work, you know. Windshield wipers on a fly's eyebrows will work. You can get them worked up right. But, uh, but anyway, that's uh, now the reason a diesel, the, 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 burn, the fuel burns so slow that it's burning all the way down. That's the point. Uh, but uh, that was a good question, too, by the way. Okay, so which is not, well, not a step? Which is not a step in a cranking vacuum test? Uh, block the throttle wide open, disable uh, ignition or fuel injection. What if you block the throttle wide open? What happens to your vacuum? It's not Based on what I just told you. You ain't got none. You block the throttle open. If you're compression, yeah, you want all the air you can get. But when you're looking for vacuum, leave that sucker shut. And that'll have like, you know, two to four inches spinning over. With the engine running, if you're checking compression with the engine running, you're probably going to see 60 PSI. Why? Volumetric efficiency. Because that air is having to go in that intake, make those curves, go down to that cylinder. The only time you're going to see volumetric efficiency increase is whenever you've got a turbocharger or supercharger because it's forcing the air in there. Got that? Okay. Number nine. Normal engine vacuum at idle is what? C. 17 to 21. That's right. And finally, Technician A says, a low but steady idle vacuum reading indicates a sticking valve. That's not true. Technician B says, a fluctuating vacuum gauge reading indicates incorrect ignition timing. Who's right about that? That's D. Neither one of those guys is right. What does what is late ignition timing make the vacuum do? Go low. Go low. Late valve timing makes it go low. EGR flow makes it go low. What, you know, uh, those are the three biggies. Technician A, though, if you had a, um, a sticking valve, wouldn't it be erratic, though? It could be, but you'd actually see the gauge indicate yeah. it. As a matter of fact, I've got a little um, thing right here I'm going to try to get in there and show you guys. And this won't take but a second, but it's, it's giving you some stuff like that. Um, if I can get in here. But anyway, that pretty well, I'm going to show you this little piece of video. It's on my, um, uh, this is a little piece of video that I put on the, the technical writer part of my Facebook page. And I'm going to show you that so you'll be able to see what a sticking valve looks like. 